I can see recording. Oh, there we go, live on YouTube. I think that's my signal to begin. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being patient with us while we sort out some of those technical uh, uh, details. Uh, good afternoon. This is a um, uh, meeting of uh, County Council. It's an official plan amendment meeting. It's a public meeting. Uh, and, and this is February the 3rd, by the way. Uh, so I want to welcome everyone. Uh, and I especially want to welcome the councillors that have joined us. Uh, uh, Councillor Mackey, uh, Councillor Patterson, I see here. Uh, and uh, I believe I saw the deputy warden at one point, but I don't see him in my list right now. Oh, and uh, Councillor Clumpus as well. Did I miss anyone? The deputy warden may have uh, fell off and he'll come back in. Maybe he'll be in that list uh, in the waiting room where I was. There he is. Okay, so very good. So I, I just will give a little bit of a, an outline um, of what's to come. Uh, so very shortly, I'll be introducing um, the county staff who will be sort of giving an overview and, and will be making a presentation. Uh, once that is done, uh, we'll be entering into our public uh, comment uh, period. Um, from my list, there are 11 people on the list. I'm gonna name them right now. And if for some reason you don't hear your name on this list and, and you wanted to speak, so you could shoot a message uh, and the staff will pick that up. Uh, so the people that I have on my list to speak, and this is the order that I have, is Wesley Wilson, Robert List, Suresh Singh, Marion Ratcliffe, Sabriel Wang, Lucy Richmond, Andrea Matrosos, I'm probably butchering that name and I apologize, uh, Peter Hambly, Bianca Metz, Brian Tashiri, and Warren Dickert. And once all those people are finished, if there are other people that uh, didn't put their name on the list and want to speak, we'll add you at that time. So once uh, you'll be given uh, five minutes uh, to make your delegation, um, at the end of uh, five minutes, I'll give you, if you're still going, I'll give you a little warning and just ask you to uh, wrap up. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be allowing five minutes for that. Once the delegations, uh, at the end of each delegation, if councillors uh, have questions of the uh, person that made the delegation, you're welcome to ask uh, questions of that delegate in case they can't stay right till the end. Um, and at the end of all of the delegations, uh, it will go back uh, to staff and staff will be making uh, some comments. Um, and then it will open up again uh, for uh, comments and, and questions and uh, debate uh, by councillors, and then we'll talk about next steps, and then we'll adjourn. Have I missed anything, staff? Excellent. So with that said, then, I'm going to turn things over, uh, I believe it's to Scott, who will be um, giving us uh, his overview. Great. Thank you very much, Warden Hicks. Uh, thanks for, for chairing the meeting today. And thanks to all those could, that could attend today, both the county councillors in attendance. We have some municipal councillors in attendance, as well as a, a lot of engaged members of the public. So we really greatly appreciate you taking time out of your Thursday to join us here today. I'm just going to share my screen here and uh, offer a brief presentation. Perhaps, Warden, you can just confirm when you can uh, see the screen there. OK, great. Again, so this is a uh, public meeting under the Planning Act to consider changes to the county official plan to implement our growth management strategy, as well as to implement some housekeeping changes. And just at the outside, I, I will apologize if you hear any noise in the background. This is a PD day, and it appears my kids don't seem to be taking professionally de professional development as seriously as maybe their teachers are. So. Um, with that, we have uh, the agenda as the warden sort of read out here. Um, we are going to have this brief presentation, which is going to do a few things. Um, first, it's going to set out the legal requirements for this meeting, and there are some important things there that you may want to pay attention to. It's going to summarize some of the changes that uh, staff and council are proposing to the official plan, as well as uh, uh, list those who have already submitted written comments to the county. And then it's also going to give a summary of those written comments received. And then, as the warden noted, we'll be hearing from people that have chosen to spoke here today, uh, to speak here today. Sorry, uh, there'll be an opportunity for council to ask any questions, and certainly an opportunity for for staff to uh, offer any clarification to some of the comments or questions we might have heard to, here today. 
at the end of all of that, uh, staff will be giving some next steps just to inform everybody on what's happening next with respect to official plan amendment number 11. And uh, following that, we'll have the meeting adjournment. So with respect to public meetings, um, the county as a municipality is required to give notice under the Planning Act when we have a public meeting. So anytime we're looking at changing our official plan, uh, we do need to have at least one of these public meetings. Um, in this case, because it's such a broad uh, nature of changes, uh, the notice was given by placing ads in local newspapers. There was also uh, a web page developed, a page on the county website. Uh, and it, notice was also given directly to an, a list of agencies that's required under the Planning Act. In this case, unlike an individual development application, we didn't send letters of notice in the mail uh, to all Gray County residents, uh, similar to what you would see maybe if you had a, a new subdivision in your neighborhood. Uh, but we tried to reach a broad matter of, of people through the website, uh, through ads in the newspaper and, and other means. And I should note that uh, all the materials related to this public meeting, uh, including a copy of this recording of the public meeting, will be available on the county's website uh, both today and, and after the fact. It is important to note that if you do wish to receive notice of the decision from the county, uh, you must make a written request to the county. And that can be done through mail at uh, 595 9th Avenue East, Owen Sound, Ontario, N4K3E3 or you can email county staff at planning at gray.ca. And it doesn't have to be anything too detailed. You can simply have one sentence indicating that you wish to receive notice of the decision and, and that will be sent to you when that decision is rendered. And I should just be 100% clear, there'll be absolutely no decisions made here today. Today is a, is a day to present some information, uh, but more importantly, to hear the feedback. So we're just uh, sort of in listening mode today and, and that decision will come from council at a later date. Uh, one more slide of, of legal requirements, sorry. Um, under the Planning Act, uh, they have uh, rules and regulations in place to try to um, uh, further encourage public participation throughout the process. Uh, it's really important for municipals, municipal councils and staff to, to hear the input from the public prior to any decisions being made. As such, there are, are, are rules under the Planning Act which state that uh, if you don't choose to participate in the process, either through writing a letter or an email to the county or making uh, verbal comments at the meeting here today, uh, you may not be entitled to appeal the decision of the county to the Ontario Land Tribunal. And similarly, if you, if you don't make those same comments either at the public meeting or provide written comments, then you might not be added as a party uh, to a hearing before the Ontario Land Tribunal should this matter get appealed. And when we do get to the public uh, comment portion of the meeting today, we are going to ask that you, you uh, please introduce yourself, uh, including giving your, your name and your address for the record. And I believe Olivia has posted in the chat, we are asking people that uh, are participating in the meeting today, uh, if you have your, your name attached to your Zoom account as anything other than your full name, if you could just edit your name in that regard, just so we're aware of who's speaking, uh, just to help us further identify where the comments are coming from. So with respect to official plan amendment number 11, there's a, some background that maybe you should be aware of. The county uh, had a new official plan named Recolor Gray approved in, in June of 2019, and that was approved by, by the province of Ontario in this regard. Uh, shortly thereafter, in February of 2020, uh, there was a, a minor housekeeping amendment change, a minor housekeeping amendment approved by the county, uh, and that was just to make some minor changes that were missed in the original official plan. Since 2020, uh, the county has been working on what we call a growth management strategy. And a growth management strategy is really a forward-looking document uh, to try to estimate um, the growth that's coming to the county, in this case, over the next 25 years. And when I speak to the growth in that regard, I'm speaking to a few different things. Uh, one is the population growth. So how many, how many new people will we see in our county over the next 25 years? Those could be people that are, are choosing to move to our county or they could be um, new births within our county. Uh, we're also uh, tied to that looking at the number of new houses we'll need to accommodate or, or new dwelling units we'll need to accommodate those people over the 25 years. And finally, we also look to the amount of employment that, uh, that is expected to be generated in that same period. And, and having those, those um, estimates give staff and council 
a better idea of, of how to plan for, for that coming growth. And as many people on the call here will be aware, um, we have been seeing um, increased growth rates, particularly over the past five years. And, and so the county worked with, uh, with our nine member municipalities, as well as a consultant, Hempson Consulting, uh, to really drill down on, on uh, what that growth projection looks like over the 25 years. And, and so Hempson, through that process, has, has given some new numbers for, for staff and council to consider. Those numbers were first presented to County Council in, in July of 2021. And through that process, uh, Council directed staff to implement those, uh, those projections into the County Official Plan. Uh, alongside those projections, there's a number of, of housekeeping changes, as I noted, uh, being proposed. So with respect to those uh, changes, some of the key elements are as follows. We're looking to extend the life of the plan. Uh, the current plan goes to the year 2038. Uh, based on some, some previous provincial guidance to say that we could only plan for 20 years. Uh, that since changed and we can now plan for 25 years as such. Uh, if council were to approve this amendment at some point in the future to this, this document, uh, the, new, the new end date for our county official plan, so to speak, would be the year 2046. As I noted, we will be looking to, to um, update the, the population and employment projections. And just to give everyone a, a brief summary, uh, the county is expected to grow by approximately 24,000 people over the next 25 years. Um, so one way to, my, to, to look at that from a planning perspective would be, you know, we're, we're roughly going to grow by just under 1,000 people each year. And so if we know that we have 1,000 new people in our community each year, again, whether they be births or people that chose to come to our community, how are we going to accommodate those people? What types of housing do we need in, in, in terms of uh, new apartments, new single detached dwellings or townhouses or semi-detached? And, and similarly, um, for those working age people, where will they be employed? And uh, the consultant has estimated that we're going to grow by approximately 8,700 jobs during that same uh, 20, 25 year time period. I should note that these numbers are based on, on uh, uh, local data, um, but it's also uh, a projection. So it's, it's not cast in stone and, and these numbers can still change. And we do know that these numbers need to be kept up to date. And, and our next uh, review of these numbers is, is scheduled to come in late 2023 after we have the full data sets from the 2021 census in that regard. So some of the other changes we're proposing to the plan at this time are to implement some of the direction that, uh, that staff have received from the county's affordable housing task force. Uh, that task force has been hard at work throughout the entire pandemic, uh, looking at ways we can uh, increase the amount of affordable housing in our communities. And so staff have been hard at work in, in terms of trying to uh, look at policy changes that would further assist that. Uh, so one of the key elements there has been to, to update, to propose updates to the county official plan policies uh, with respect to allowing for more what we used to call secondary suites, and now we're calling additional residential units. So these could be things like a basement apartment or a ground floor apartment in a home, or it could be something like a, an apartment uh, above a detached garage or in an accessory structure in that regard. So the general theme of the changes to the plan is, is to be more permissive uh, with respect to those additional units. Uh, there's also further clarification on the policies uh, with respect to allowing for tiny homes. There's some proposed changes to our recommended densities in our primary settlement areas. So these will be our, our, our larger settlement areas across the county that have full municipal water and municipal sewer services. Uh, we're also looking at providing some direction on, um, on short-term lot creation where you have larger, larger pieces of land. There's some mapping changes being proposed through this, um, this official plan amendment, and I'll show a few of those on the screen in just a minute. Um, but one of the key mapping changes is, is to uh, include two additional future secondary plan areas in the municipality of West Gray, adjacent to the, the town of Hanover. And this would be based on some uh, detailed work that the, the town of Hanover has been conducting over the past few years. Uh, there's also been some changes that are needed based on changes to provincial legislation in the Planning Act. So former references to the term bonusing, which could, could allow for bonus density, have, have been uh, deleted from the plan as that's been deleted from, from the legislation. We've clarified some of the on-farm diversified use policies as, as they relate to campgrounds. To note that campgrounds could generally be supported in our rural areas, but we might not necessarily be looking at campgrounds in our prime agricultural areas. We've also proposed some policies which look at the preservation and, and reuse of old barns, including clarifying how one might preserve a former bank barn uh, when you're looking at a surplus farm dwelling severance. Uh, we've proposed to clarify the policies around rural lot creation and rural lot density. 
There's been some further interpretive policies proposed around bedrock and, and shale resources across the county. Um, one of the other key changes in this, this document is we are looking at implementing some of the early find, findings of the county's climate change action plan. Uh, so there's further direction on, in this proposed amendment on, uh, on uh, steps we might take to, to mitigate the impacts of climate change in that regard. We've clarified some of the policies around the county's uh, rail corridor uh, to make sure that that corridor is, uh, is there for future needs and, and preserved as, as the CP rail trail at this time. Uh, we're proposing to add a biodiversity offsetting policy in the plan. And then there's been some further uh, definitions and, and tweaks proposed to the plan. With respect to some of the mapping changes, I'll just go through some different types of the mapping. Uh, this first map that you see on your screen there shows the, the uh, two um, future secondary plan areas, one at the north end of Hanover and, and one at the southeast end of Hanover, Hanover that are being proposed. And as I noted, these are based on the work that, uh, that uh, the town of Hanover has been undertaking for the last number of years. Uh, this one that you see in here is, is already in the plan, so that's already implemented. Um, there's some other changes to recognize some existing larger industrial facilities across the county that didn't previously have recognition. Uh, so this is a facility just uh, west of, of uh, Durham in this regard, off Barrier 4. This is the former Interforest facility. Uh, there's been another proposed change to recognize the, the uh, Chapman's ice cream uh, distribution facility on, on Highway 10 south of Markdale. Uh, these facilities are legally established and have been there for years, just never had recognition in our county plan. Uh, there's been some mapping changes proposed um, to, to clarify the county's aggregate resource area policies. And so just to expand on what that means, what you're seeing on the screen there in, in sort of the copper orange color is where we've mapped our primary sand and gravel um, resources across the county. And, and those resources, just as we protect our quality farmland, are protected should they be need for future extraction purposes. In this case, what we've done is we've taken out some of the existing developed areas. So this is a uh, a subdivision in the municipality of West Gray called Highland Estates, recognizing, of course, um, that we're not going to suddenly start uh, uh, extracting gravel or sand resources in each of these residential lots. Uh, so the resources um, will, will be maintained in, in the larger areas, but in, in some of the smaller uh, residential developments, uh, these resources have been removed from the mapping. Um, we've also implemented um, some approved uh, gravel pit and quarry operations across the county. Uh, so this is a pit operation that was approved uh, by the Ontario Municipal Board in uh, the Township of Chatsworth. So what you see in purple there is the approved uh, gravel pit in this case. Uh, and then we've tweaked some mapping there, uh, tweaked some mapping uh, to recognize some, some um, existing development areas that were missed in the last go round of, of the uh, county official plan. Uh, so what you're seeing in, in sort of the teal color here is our inland lakes and shoreline designation. And we had inadvertently mapped this as agricultural in the last iteration of the plan. So it's just uh, correcting some of our own errors in that regard. Um, with respect to the people that have submitted comments to date, um, we've, we've had a, a wonderful response to the request for feedback and, and a really diverse range of comments received. And, and I know it is a lengthy list, but I am going to take the time to read out the names that have, have chosen to share their thoughts with us, because it is really important. Municipal governments are meant to be a, a two-way conversation and particularly planning in this case. Um, so I would like to recognize all those people and bodies that have chosen to share their comments. Uh, so we've had comments from the City of Owen Sound, the Town of Hanover, the Hanover Planning Advisory Committee, the Township of Southgate, the Town of the Blue Mountains, Town of Saugeen Shores, the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, um, Andrea Matrasovs, Andrew Pascuzo, Ben and Tracy Plackholm, Bianca Metz, Robert List, Suresh Singh, Brian Nelson, Chris Palmer, the Blue Water Astronomical Society, Cuesta Planning Consultants, Devin Glue, Brian Hack and Jack Shank, Frank Williams, Graham Barker, John Linealuk, I apologize, John, if I've butchered your name there, uh, Karen Post, uh, Ken Cox, Christine Loft on behalf of Solomon Martin and Community, Lorraine Rogers, Lucy Richmond, Marion Ratcliffe, Peter Hambly, Romulus Barabas, Stuart Doyle on behalf of Barry's Construction, Thomas Glancy from MHBC Planning on behalf of Walker Aggregates, Warren Dickert, and Wesley Wilson. And I should clarify that some of these people have submitted detailed comments for us to consider. Some have just asked to be involved in the process and haven't necessarily submitted their comments yet. 
And with respect to some of the municipal comments that we've received, some have been endorsed by their committees and councils, and some have just submitted staff comments at this time for, for county staff and, and council to review. With respect to a summary of, of some of the themes we've heard about so far, um, we've heard from a number of people on the need for strengthened policies uh, in the county um, to, to preserve our dark skies and to minimize the amount of light pollution uh, that we're generating through our, our new and existing development in that regard. Um, we've also heard support from, from a number of people with respect to the future secondary plan mapping adjacent to the town of Hanover. Uh, we've heard about the need to expand Second Street in Hanover through to Gray Road 28, just outside of Hanover. Uh, we got a very site specific request to remove a, an existing gravel pit that's now been rehabilitated where the license has been surrendered to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and Northern Development of Mines. It's a bit of a handful of inter in terms of a ministry name now. We've heard some support for, for tiny homes. We heard some concerns raised with respect to the proposed natural heritage offsetting policies. Uh, there's support for one very specific mapping change in the Township of Georgian Bluffs. Uh, we've heard some questions about um, uh, some of the new policies around additional residential units outside of our settlement areas. Uh, there was a policy about uh, allowing for growth uh, in municipalities beyond the allocated target. So that would be to say if, if municipality X hit their allocated target before the, the 25 years, uh, could they keep growing? Uh, we've heard questions about um, applying the minimum density uh, policies in our primary settlement areas and making sure that that's done uh, on an equitable basis across all of our primary settlement areas. Oops, sorry. Um, we've definitely heard some support for, for the proposed climate change policies and people have given us some very useful suggestions on how we might further strengthen those policies. Uh, we got some comments about some minor mapping changes that should be considered in Southgate. Uh, we received a detailed letter with respect to um, further expanding the, the uh, amount of farms that we could consider on-farm diversified uses for uh, across the county and, and allowing for it on smaller farms, such as uh, farms between 10 hectares and 19.9 hectares in the agricultural designation. I should just clarify, on-farm diversified uses are generally those, those uh, businesses we see as, as, as uh, sort of a side business to the farm in that regard. Um, we've had a, a request uh, that we defer any decisions on, on OPA 11 or official plan amendment number 11 until there's further growth management work done at the municipal level. We've had some questions about the growth numbers, the employment projections and the seasonal employment, uh, seasonal population projections. Uh, we've had some support for the updated density policies in our primary settlement areas, as well as the additional residential unit policies. We've had support for some of the proposed rail corridor policies. We've had some questions about the uh, residential unit policies, and then we've had some suggested changes to the aggregate bedrock and shale policies. And so we're about to turn it over to the public uh, uh, comment here, and I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen just for a second. But just prior to doing so, I missed uh, something at the very beginning of this. I, I will say that although I'm the one doing the speaking today, um, this has been a, a team effort. There have been a number of people uh, that have contributed to these proposed amendments. Uh, first and foremost, the direction and leadership shown by, by County Council in this regard. But then I'd also like to recognize a number of members of our, our planning department team, including uh, uh, Randy, Carolyn, Linda, Becky, Stephanie, Brad, and Monica, who have all contributed in different ways to the draft policies, the draft mapping, some of the research that went into it. And, and so it, it really is a team effort. And, and um, with on the notion of that team effort, we're looking forward to hearing the further feedback that uh, we get at the meeting today, because that contributes to, to it. Um, so as the word read out at the beginning of the meeting, these are the list of speakers. Um, there are a few of these speakers that have requested we share visuals, but just for the sake of being able to see everyone on the screen, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for now until we get to the point where those visuals are needing to be shared again. So Mr. Warden, I'll turn it back over to you to uh, uh, turn it to the first speaker. Well, thank you very much, uh, Scott, for that very detailed um, uh, presentation and overview. Uh, I'm quite confident that that presentation probably um, generates some questions uh, from uh, councillors, but to councillors, I would say, we'll have our opportunity to ask those questions at the end of all of the uh, delegations. So I would just ask you to note your questions and uh, we'll have our turn later on. All right, so we're gonna get to the uh, public comment uh, list now, uh, starting with Wesley Wilson. Hello and welcome. 
Hello, sorry, I was just in the process of uh, switching from panelist or from viewer to panelist. So um, apologies if I missed something in between in your remarks. Oh, you're you're good. I had the same experience. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my name's Wes Wilson. Um, I'm uh, here representing Ontario Barn Preservation today, as uh, you may recall the earlier deputation that I did uh, to each township and uh, municipality within Gray County and then to Gray County itself. And uh, I'm just here today to, uh, to thank Gray County planning staff for integrating uh, the comments and uh, policy uh, suggestions that our organization made and uh, offer our support to the suggestions and policy positions that uh, planning staff have put forward uh, at this time regarding Ontario uh, barn preservation uh, policy avenues, along with the other heritage policy uh, positions that have been put forward from Great County uh, planning staff. So those are uh, my comments. Kept them brief today, so you don't have to listen to me for 10 minutes this time. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for that. Um, and I guess I, I'm messing up because I'm supposed to ask everybody for their name and address. So if you want to give your uh, address, uh, feel free yeah. to do so. Or you can just type it in to the comments section and then staff will have it there. Your choice. Um, yeah, so my address is 888 Charlottesville Road 8 in Simcoe, Ontario. So 888 Charlottesville Road 8 in Simcoe. Simcoe, Ontario. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Thank nice you. to see you again. Same to you, folks. Okay. We're going to turn secondly to Mr. Suresh Singh. I believe they're under the name LC Management. Yeah. Development. Uh, I, I, hi, I made a request for Bob List to, go, he's with our organization as well, to, to speak first. Um, is that possible? Oh, I thought you wanted to be, I thought you wanted to speak oh. first. That's oh, the way I understood. Did I write that wrong? Uh, my apologies. I want Bob to speak first. You want Bob possible. to speak first. Okay, well, that's fine. Can we okay. um, upgrade? Uh, my apologies. Your list right now, and uh... yes, just one moment. No worries. Or, or, you know what? It's fine. I will go first. We're good. <laughs> let, Raise let, your let. hands if, if you're ready yeah. to go. We're ready. I, to go. I'm definitely ready to go. My name is Suresh Singh. Address nine zero nine Davenport Road, second floor, Toronto. Mary Six George to Bob Seven. I'm the president. I'll ask you to say that again, if you could, because staff are probably writing it down. <laughs> oh, okay. Nine zero nine Davenport Road, yeah. second floor, Toronto. Mary six George, two Bob seven. Perfect. And thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm the president and CEO of LC Development Group, Loon Call. We are builders and developers of attainable ownership housing in rural recreational communities across Canada. Um, and for those constructing and building this type of product, we are probably the largest company in the country that do low rise of this nature. And we understand um, this, uh, this need and how to execute on it, on it very, very well. Uh, I'm hopping on today because I, I wanted to, I wanted to just speak to one particular issue and then Bob List would speak to uh, various others. In section two and in first paragraph, um, it refers to uh, the housing growth and it states that pace population growth for reasons of aging population and seasonal growth. I, th that concerned me because I, I, I was not quite certain if those were the two primary metrics that were being used in order to anticipate and develop your, uh, your growth um, numbers. Because in communities where we have, have, uh, have done work, we have outpaced growth in a very, very significant way. And there's a lot of other reasons why communities have grown when we've participated in them. 
Um, and I'm not just saying our company. There are a lot of companies out there that that create product that uh, that draw the attention of, of consumers all over. Uh, so I'm very concerned that your growth numbers are going to be uh, quite understated. Uh, we have, you know, there's, there are new businesses, obviously. There are, are movements of businesses like Chapman's considering moving some people over to, uh, to Markdale. And um, there's going to be housing necessary for, for homes in those areas. There are people in the county that are multi-generational homes that have young people living at home because they cannot find a home they can afford. Uh, we come in, we create homes that they can afford. We provide uh, various mechanisms that help them afford it, the down payment assistance, the deposit assistance. Uh, we provide housing prices for people within the county at a lower rate than we would provide people outside of the county. Um, so where that sounds like our impact will not be uh, 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 countywide, but more more uh, isolated into the community, into the specific community that we do work in. That is true. But given the proximity of Simcoe and other Simcoe County and, and other counties, we will draw from a, a much larger um, audience, and uh, we will have a lot more emigration into uh, into Gray County, and specifically right now, Markdale and Meaford, where we are um, developing two reasonably sizable developments. Um, when we look at uh, other reasons, unfortunately, there are divorces that happen. And what we've seen in, in, in communities everywhere is that they will, a home needs to be sold. And, uh, and now families are struggling to find another home that automatically adds another, um, another home there. Uh, there is uh, lower quality and, and um, not a strong rental stock available in the broader area. So when you're looking at Simcoe County and again, other counties, our particular housing type will drive people to uh, Gray County. Um, so these, these are a bunch of the different, these are just a small handful of the reasons why we see this growth number, uh, we, we question it. When we, we've done a lot in Muskoka, and in particular, Gravenhurst and, and Bracebridge. And each of those cases, when we have, uh, when the growth study has been done, the, uh, the consultant who's done it has uh, identified lands within those communities that are truly not developable. They may be available land. They may appear logical to, um, uh, a develop, to develop, but for various reasons, they're not developable. And I wouldn't expect that a, that, a, that a consultant is going to be able to go out there and check for bedrock, check, check for groundwater and do all of those things. Um, but I have seen in many cases lands identified for future growth, uh, specific sites identified for, for future growth that simply were not developable. They take the gross acreage. They say, OK, we can build this many houses on that gross acreage. Meanwhile, the, the, the actual developable, developable acreage could be half of that. And, and what, what we have seen, and when I look at the plans here, uh, I am concerned that the sites that are identified, the areas that are identified are simply not enough, that there are logical locations to develop that are uh, adjacent to existing developable sites where, where um, uh, where it makes sense for from a servicing perspective, it makes sense on a on a uh, uh, the, the the quality of, of of site basis and proximity to to um, to the uh, services within the community. Um, I believe another look needs to be taken at this particular uh, issue for the for the growth side, and I believe there needs to be an expansion of the reasons why uh, you, the population is going to, to uh, uh, the household growth is going to uh, outpace growth. Um, so that's my, th th those are my comments. And Bob from our, our organization will also uh, address things a little more specifically, but I wanted to point out our experiences in, in other communities and why I believe that we, we are understating things and it's very specifically related to um, 
uh, more analysis on the lands that are being brought into the developable area. And does it truly do that? Number one. Number two, the, uh, the reasons for people moving into the communities. Uh, and we have a lot of people coming in from, from, uh, from the GTA, from Caledon. Sorry, I'm interrupting you, Mr. Singh. Uh, the five okay. minutes is now up. I know you're okay. about to wrap up, but I'll just give you maybe 30 seconds if you want to. Uh, oh, I, I, I'm good. I, started to, I was just doing a little bit of a synopsis. I think everyone heard it. It's being recorded, so it's all good. Appreciate all right. it. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you for that. And to Scott, uh, there was a question asked about Section uh, 2.1 with the growth uh, projections. Uh, do you want to answer that now, or do you want to comment on that uh, at the end when you're going to be making your, uh, your general comments? Sure. Thanks, Mr. Warden. Um, through you, just by way of some quick, quick clarification, um, thank you, Suresh, for those comments. Um, with respect to what ended up in the draft policy, it, it gave a very uh, narrow um, list of, of why we're growing. In the growth management strategy itself, it does expand on that to touch on some of the points that uh, that you've raised in terms of the different reasons why our communities are growing. And that does vary across the county from, from people moving in from the GTA or other communities to, to other reasons. So we'll certainly consider all of your comments and and uh, and take a second look at things and, and reach out to you and or Bob if we have any, any further questions. So thank you for providing us. Thank you again, Mr. Singh. And with that said, we'll turn uh, now to Bob a list. Um, I don't see my picture, but that's probably a good thing if I can be heard. I'm not going on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking the bait. We can hear you perfectly, though. Okay, I'll, I'll build on then. Uh, my name is Bob List, L-I-S-T, 103 South Bank Drive. That's one word, South and Bank Drive, Bracebridge, Ontario. Papa, one Lima, one Golf, three. Excellent. Thank you for that, sir. You have the floor. And oh, we can see you now, too. It's amazing. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted uh, your worship to, and members of council and staff, uh, we have a really good relationship going with uh, your county staff and also some uh, individual municipal staff. And as Suresh noted, we're looking forward to actually putting into the ground, starting in Meaford very shortly, um, the construction of affordable housing, which is the product that we, our company delivers. Um, I wanted to build upon what Suresh has already said and emphasize that um, in section two of your new official plan, uh, I believe that the wording should be reworked in that section to identify that the growth projections are just that, they're projections and they are not limits. They are too often interpreted as being limits. And in my opinion, they shouldn't be. And there's a whole host of reasons for that, including some of the things that Suresh mentioned and that, uh, in my opinion, um, appropriate examination of the land mass required to support the growth population projections, as, but more importantly, the growth household projections, um, those land masses, uh, at least in the, uh, the community that we're now working in, in, in uh, Gray Highlands, in our opinion, uh, were not identified properly they need to be amended. We're going through an amendment process with both the county and the uh, local municipality in that regard, um, which I'm going to speak to in a moment. But in my opinion, uh, that section in particular, paragraph five in section two, needs to be rewritten so that those uh, projections are identified as targets, not limits to development. Um, in that, I go on to the next point that I'd like to make in that the provincial policy statement that's used as a guideline, the county official plan, the local official plan, all of these documents are guidelines. They're not statutes, they're not regulations, and they're not bylaws. And we've lost sight of that over the last 35 years in the province of Ontario, but that is in fact the law that applies to official plans. They're guideline policy documents. They are not stringent things like zoning bylaws, et cetera. 
in my opinion, the upper tier plan for the County of Gray, and not part of this exercise, but in a subsequent exercise, I would strongly suggest that you look at alternative ways of identifying settlement areas at the county level. In particular, to get you out of the business of identifying limits to growth at the county level and specific land use designations at the county level. Both of those things have to be done at the local level and they can be done more effectively at the local level. And when they are done at the local level, they should not require amendment at the upper tier level. It's a duplication of process that's completely unnecessary. There are examples in Ontario of municipalities that have taken a more strategic approach at the upper tier. Be pleased to uh, uh, give you copies of those types of things, but it makes the, the process much simpler when a, a, an amendment process has to go forward. And it also imposes and requires the local municipality to do its work that it normally would do. And I know in that regard, one of the comments that Scott made in his presentation today, and that's that uh, the limits of the developable area of the uh, uh, community of Hanover uh, are being reconsidered. One of the reasons for that is because of the good work done by the uh, staff and, and the council of the town of Hanover. Um, they know about their community. They know more detail and will probably always know more detail. And I think that needs to be recognized in, in this uh, official plan. Um, the wise management of infrastructure is dealt with in your new uh, revised policy in paragraph six of section two. I strongly support what it says, but I also note that it doesn't say a lot about what needs to be required when municipalities look at identifying lands that should be settled within settlement area limits and how those lands should be designated. I have a list of a half a dozen things that were not taken into account in the community of Markdale uh, and should have been, but were not by either the county or the, or the local municipality. And I think generically those things which are so important in land use planning, including things like not just property boundaries, but property ownership boundaries, sanitary sewer catchment areas, storm sewage catchment areas, significant topographical constraints and in influences, and vehicular accessibility and connectivity to the existing built community, those generic things should be identified in the upper tier plan as matters that need to be. I know I'm interrupting you, um, but you've reached the five minutes. I'm just gonna ask, I'm gonna give you an additional minute just to wrap up, please. Um, I'm going to say, Your Worship, that uh, these submissions have been uh, detailed in a written submission that we'll be forwarding tomorrow. I'm pleased to do that. We'll, we also believe, as a last point, that we would like county staff to review uh, again the submission that we made late this year with respect to the uh, additional lands that we own in the community of Markdale. And we believe that it's appropriate because site-specific issues are being dealt with in this matter that the uh, um, request of that we've already submitted by amendment to the county and local plans be considered as part of your county official plan this time through. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. And thank you for being here today. We appreciate all those uh, comments. Okay, so I saw some messages uh, come up. Olivia, are we able to uh, promote Ms. Uh, Radcliffe? She is going to be one of the phone call uh, oh, participants. Yeah. Yeah. So I will promote her to be able to talk, but she will not be able to have a video. Very good. Ms. Ratcliffe, uh, I can see uh, your, Im not the image, but I can see that you're there. You have the floor. Hello? Yes, what? we can, Hello? can hear you. Can you hear me? I can, Hello? yes. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, greetings to Warden Hicks, Gray County Council staff and the attending public. I am Marian Ratcliffe. I live in Gray County in West Gray. I have emailed my address it's because as a private citizen, I have an issue with uh, publishing in my home address on the internet. I hope you will appreciate that. So you're um, going to anyway. the staff have your, your, your address? Yeah, they have, they have my address. They're nodding their heads. So yes, continue, please. Okay, thank you. Um, anyways, I am here today to express my concern regarding the ever-increasing light pollution in Gray County. 
and to ask that Gray County Council make changes to the official plan to slow or better yet decrease the level of light pollution in the region through the inclusion of an outdoor lighting or as it's also known, a dark sky policy. Letters from the public and organizations have been submitted on this matter speaking to the impact of light pollution on human health, animal and wildlife welfare, the environment, tourism, the economy, and interference with science and astronomy. These are all valid and important concerns and I support them. I believe it's important to include clear guidance for outdoor lighting in the official plan, stating what is expected from developers when we ask for dark sky approved lighting. I've had the opportunity to express my concerns and request effective dark sky approved lighting at a local level for proposed developments in West Gray. The response that has been shared back to me is that developers are interested in complying, but they need to be told what is expected of them. Otherwise, they will just do what everyone else is doing, a shielded fixture pointed down, but with no regard for the color or intensity of the light source itself. And that is not enough to qualify as dark sky approved. An overbright, overly blue white light source will cancel any benefit from shielding when the light hits surfaces or particle in the air and bounces. So yes, we need to provide them with clear instructions as to what we mean by dark sky approved lighting. Recommendations to reduce, reduce light pollution through the use of timers, placement, and aiming of light sources, and to avoid lighting where possible through the use of reflective surfaces and light colored building materials are also an important part of this policy. And yes, this does need to be done at a county level. Otherwise, we could end up with a patchwork of inconsistent municipal policies, nor can we wait while they work on their own official policies at their own pace. Gray County is working on the amendment to the official uh, plan right now, and this is an environmental concern that needs to be dealt with now, not after many developments on the schedule are already built or too far along in the process to have the outdoor lighting changed. Gray County is a booming development area. There are currently about 40 projects on the planning board for Gray. Blue Mountains has 20 that could result in over 2,000 homes once completed. Southgate is lo looking to expand by one to 2,000 homes. The large project in Own Sound has 830 units. We heard from Markdale today, we know they're going big. And so, and so many more. It's not just the street light. There will also be outdoor lighting on homes and all the commercial and recreational developments that will follow with signs and parking lot lighting and outdoor lighting. We need to get on top of this before the skies of Gray County are as polluted as the GTA. And it is not just lighting and developments that needs to be addressed. Some of the billboards I see have overbright lighting that shines upwards, illuminating everything around them. There are also light pollution concerns from the electronic message boards that are becoming more common. I and others, we are more than willing to help staff develop policy. I have been in communication with Scott Taylor and have provided what information I can to help his people create the best possible policy. And I look forward to continue working with Gray County staff to achieve this goal. Light pollution travels for many kilometers. From my home, just east of Durham, I can see the glow domes over Durham, Hanover, Markdale, every community up Highway 6, yes, even own sound. On a clear night, I can even see the tight band of red lights on the horizon to the west that mark out the wind turbine projects on the coast of Lake Huron. Light pollution travels, and we need to stop it from getting any worse than it already is. We need to protect our beautiful dark skies. Thank you for your time and this opportunity to make my concerns and thoughts known. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Radcliffe. Sorry, I'm doing several things at once here. Okay, we're going to be turning next uh, to Ms. Wang. Um, is it Sabriel Wang? Did I pronounce the first name correctly? Hi, yes, yes. Um, hi there, Mr. Warden. I am joining in um, for, so for Town of Soggin Shores. I am the new housing coordinator. Um, and I believe our uh, attainable housing task force from both the town and the county, uh, Bruce County, 
have been working with you guys on the issue of attainable housing before. Um, so I, um, I'm the product of essentially one of the recommendations and I am just interested today in joining and hearing what some of the thoughts are, um, especially regarding the additional residential units and, um, uh, and the response um, relating to that, um, like tiny homes, garden suites, so on. And I um, actually uh, got notice of this from a recommendation, recommendation from one of the attendees, I believe uh, she is here, Bianca Metz. <laughs> um, so thank her. Thanks to Bianca for that. Just playing, um, if I could interrupt you just for one quick second, and I apologize. Yeah. Um, uh, Scott, do we need uh, an address uh, for this delegate, given her position? It, it, it's not. It's not 100% necessary. No, we can we can record it as a town and Sullivan Shore staff member. Very good. Thank you, then. I apologize, Ms. Wang. Uh, no problem. And I think that would be it for what I have to say. I'm mostly here to listen. Thanks so much. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was about to start the timer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. I'm going to go down to item person number eight on my list, which is uh, Peter Hambly. He's going to be next. Hello, Warden Hicks, just popping in uh, for the communication side of things. Yes. I currently am unable to see Peter on our list. If he is currently on the call under a different name, uh, we would recommend that he raise his hand somehow on Zoom or write in the chat or change the name of the Zoom ID. Right. I thought that I had seen him uh, in the list at one time, but maybe I was wrong about that. But there are people that I know on this call who may be able to reach uh, Mr. Hamby by text and, and perhaps they can uh, send him that message. Yes, currently we do not have him as an attendee. If you'd like to move on to yeah. uh, Bianca. Yeah, yes. yes. Mr. Warden, sorry to interrupt here further. Uh, Bianca is one of the people that has shared some visuals with us ahead of time. So I'm just going to share my screen and bring up her visuals. Very good. I don't see her in my, oh, here she is. <laughs> You're sitting right in front of me. I just have to look around. Hi, Bianca. Okay, you have the floor now. You'll just give your name and address first and then for your, uh, get started with your presentation. It looks like she's uh, unmuted, but we can't hear you, Bianca. Maybe hit mute and then unmute again. That might uh, fix it. Bianca, this is Gray County Communications here. Um, if you're using a headset, if you're using micro a microphone, um, the possibility is that it's not working for us at the moment. If you're able to unplug and use your computer's audio um, or try a different headset, we could see if that works. But currently we are unable to hear you. Okay, take your time. You might need to do to log out and come right back in again and see if that uh, corrects things. Yes, that is also a possibility, Bianca. If you'd like to um, either exit or um, call back in, there are two options that Scott would have shared with you. Okay. And maybe while we wait for that to uh, fix itself, is uh, Mr. Hamley with us as yet? No. He's not uh, with us. I'd probably move on to the list. Um, Brian Tashiri uh, appears as next. Thank you, Warden Hicks. I'm hoping you can hear me. 
I can perfectly. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to provide comments. Um, I'm going to summarize. Uh, we the town of Hanover sent in detailed comments with respect to OPA 11. Uh, I'm going to summarize those uh, only today. And Brian, uh, sorry, I'm interrupting you as well. Um, uh, you're, uh, I know you well, CAO <laughs> for the town of Hanover for staff yeah, sorry. purposes. You'll just use that address, correct? Sorry, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, Brian Tesheri, I'm CAO for town of Hanover, 341 10th Street in Hanover, uh, N4N 1P5. All right. Okay. So, uh, Scott, I appreciate the uh, um, the uh, map here. Um, however, I've lost. Oh no, I haven't. I've got it. Okay. So this is a this is a map of Gray County, as you can see. Hanover is the small green area in the southwest portion of the county. Uh, Hanover occupies less than a quarter of one percent of the total area of Gray County, but has eight point two percent of the population and 11.8% of the jobs. According to the Great County Growth Management Strategy, Hanover's proportion of population and jobs relative to the rest of the county will continue to grow to 2046. As you can see, Hanover is bordered on three sides by West Gray and on one side by Brockton, which is in Bruce County. Hanover is a shared community of interest that provides jobs, housing choices, schools, social services, healthcare services, and goods and services for people not only in Hanover, but also in West Gray and Brockton and beyond. In our view, Hanover is a true regional center, much like Owen Sound is. The town continues to grow and interest in development along with it. We believe strongly that growth in Hanover benefits the larger community in this part of Gray and Bruce counties, because as growth occurs, new business opportunities and jobs are created for residents in the wider area. As growth occurs, more housing choices are made available to a growing and more diversified population. Young people need places to start out and older folks need places to retire to. This is what Hanover can continue to offer if growth is allowed. Hanover's shortage of land has been a topic of discussion and debate for some 40 years. Over the past seven years, decisions have been made and studies, reports, and comprehensive reviews have been completed, which all point to the fact that the land supply in Hanover has long been limited, and there is a need to look beyond the town's borders to accommodate its growth. Areas of land to accommodate growth were reviewed to the north, northwest, and east of Hanover. The areas selected for consideration and forming future secondary plan areas in OPA 11 extend into West Gray to the north and east. There's actually a local precedent for this approach in the form of the settlement resulting from Hanover's appeal of County OPA 80. In this, there was agreement that a future secondary plan area and extension of the primary settlement area be established to the east of Hanover in the municipality of West Gray. For those who suggest that Hanover has not done enough with respect to accommodating growth within its own boundaries, I can tell you that Hanover has been practicing intensification for years primarily out of necessity, but also because provincial direction in this area was anticipated. Over the past several years, Hanover has created an additional 90 homes through infilling policies, and we have over 700 new apartment units, either in the construction or planning stage. In 2020, Hanover continued its comprehensive review with a natural heritage and constraints assessment for its special policy areas, specifically in the north part of Hanover, where it appears Hanover has a lot of developable lands. The review showed that there are additional high constraints as they relate to natural heritage features and functions within these areas, including a major hydro transmission corridor. This work resulted in an amendment to the town's official plan, which applied appropriate land use designations to all lands within Hanover. The entire town has now been planned out for its ultimate development. The net developable area within Hanover's boundaries is actually less than what was previously considered available. To meet the 25 year planning horizon, Hanover currently requires an additional 109 hectares of developable land, including 22 residential, 28 employment and 38 hectares of commercial lands. This is no longer just about a shortage of commercial lands. This urban land shortfall 
will continue to steadily increase over time as the county's growth projections confirm Hanover will continue to grow. Regardless, we plan to advance development of employment lands in the north, but this will take years and millions of dollars and will not solve the overall shortage of developable land in Hanover. We're aware that there is a, a landowner who claims to own lands along 85% of Hanover's eastern boundary, and we're aware that he has no interest in selling or developing any of these lands. We will continue to respect this position in our planning uh, decisions, keeping in mind that there are also landowners in the proposed secondary plan areas that have indicated strong interest in bringing their lands into Hanover. We are also aware West Cray is in the process of completing their own growth plan and have indicated that they are not in the position to discuss restructuring until that work is complete. Hanover welcomes the results of a plan based on sound planning principles and Gray County's official plan, both of which indicate growth will be directed to settlement areas where there are existing services and infrastructure to support growth. So Mr. Tashiri, I'm interrupting you. Uh, yes, yeah. We've reached the five minute uh, mark. And so I'll give you a minute to uh, wrap up if you would, please. Thank you. Without question, it's, it's Hanover's desire to work collaboratively with our neighbors and Gray County in finding a solution, as opposed to pressing the province to interview. Over the last few years, members of council, senior management, and our consulting team have made it a priority to meet and have discussions with adjacent municipalities and upper tier levels of government, including the province, and we'll continue to do that. As indicated in the county's OP, Hanover is one of two primary settlement areas in Gray County, and the, and the county has targeted future growth to these areas. We, are, we, we support the amendments for, for growth outlined in OPA 11. We realize that the principles of growth outlined in this official plan amendment are only one step and that there is still much work to be done, but it's an important step and one that finally acknowledges that Hanover does not have sufficient lands to meet its growth projections and the growth planning requirements of the PPS and Gray County. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so I've been seeing a lot of uh, messages. Your Hamley does not want to speak. Very good, so I'll cross him off my list. Uh, we're back now to um, Ms. Metz, and I believe that she's done several things. Uh, she's probably got a video as well as uh, potentially audio from a phone. Am I correct about that, Olivia? Hopefully. Bianca, is that you? Yes. Okay, we can hear you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Amazing. Bianca Metz, and I have submitted my address privately with the county. Okay, and I'm seeing heads nodding, so go right ahead. Great, thank you. So, good afternoon, good afternoon, <laughs> councillors and county staff. Gordon, thank you for facilitating this meeting and to the Affordable Housing Task Force, thank you for being a great advocate in affordable housing. My name is Bianca Metz, as I stated. I am a tiny house consultant and sustainable living specialist with my business, The Giving Tree. Today, I will be addressing item 10, tiny homes, specifically addressing section 4.2.4, tiny homes as garden suites with the opportunity to reside on lease land. I wish to applaud the County of Gray for considering this affordable housing solution. This type of policy is dear to my heart as I personally live in a tiny home with my family and within the span of four years went from living in a condo with no sense of home ownership or financial freedom to paying off our debt while paying a low mortgage and happily leasing six acres, growing our own food and seeing our son have access to nature daily. It is my hope that with this amendment finding its way to council that they consider a few important benefits. Consider your aging parents, your growing children, or yourself. Many here today may be a county homeowner, but many, if not all of you, know someone who will struggle to enter the housing market within their lifetime. So I encourage council to see the merit in this framework to allow lease lands through a temporary use bylaw with the county. Not to only diversify and increase opportunities for affordable housing, but more importantly, allow for home ownership now that you can mortgage a dwelling that's not tied to land. Next slide, please. Allowing tiny homes on leased land creates many opportunities. The emergent opportunity is building a bridge towards accessible housing as well as affordable housing. 
People can set the bar at financial freedom rather than our current reality of maybe one day paying off an $800,000 home, not to mention attempting to save for retirement or live life while we do it. With this solution being a caveat to financial freedom, folks paying an affordable mortgage and lease payment will have more resources to share within the local economy. This framework also allows for so many solutions to the traditional formula of the way we live. Land leasing opens the doors for aging in place where elderly homeowners could lease land to their family, grandchildren, or perhaps someone else who may, able, may be able to care for the property. It encourages multi-generational living whereby families can share land in a safe and protected manner. Ultimately, each situation will give someone, some family, some couple, the ability to own a home for the fraction of what we see in the market. All we need to make that happen is policy. Now, finally, the benefits for your city are immeasurable. Tiny homes build green cities. They pave the way for carbon neutrality, and they offer an opportunity to allow low-density housing in a practical way. Tiny homes in rural landscapes can lessen the stress on urban sprawl and high-density housing that adds to already overused grids in towns where heritage and local businesses should find their stronghold again. This is less likely while many municipalities are persuaded to build multi-unit housing. This gentle intensification will help the city accommodate its growing projected population and facilitate affordable housing without having to wait for development. This will provide your current homeowners and the, the opportunity of a rental income as well, while paving the way for current and future residents to secure homeownership in a way that they have never been able to before. So congratulations again for the county to in your hard work and considering this. And I think it'll be an integral support of part of innovative change and thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much for that. Appreciate you being patient with us while we work through the technology challenges. And same, thank you. Okay, so last on my list is uh, Mr. Warren Dickert. We have a note from him saying that he wishes to observe only for today. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> That's it from the formal list. I would just ask if there's anybody else uh, out there who would like to have an opportunity to speak. Um, th this is now your chance. You we ask that people raise their hands, yes. Raise your hand or shoot a message in there or something. Just let us know. So I see no hands and I see no messages. So that tells me that uh, everybody who would like to speak has had the opportunity. So thank you very much with that uh, completed. That's the end of our list and the end of the public comment uh, period. I'm gonna go into the hands of staff again. Uh, my question is, uh, would you like me to open things up now to the county councilors uh, to ask uh, questions of staff or of delegates that may still um, uh, be here? Uh, or would you like uh, Scott to do your comments and then uh, have me uh, turn things over to the councillors for questions. What's your preference? We're at your disposal here, Mr. Warden, but I, I think it might be appropriate to, to, to go to uh, councillors and, and then certainly if there are any questions from councillors to staff or else uh, responses that staff want to make to, to the de delegates we heard, we can do that all before they, they wrap up comments. Very good. Thank you. So I'll now turn uh, to the councillors in attendance. Is there any councillor who wants to say anything or ask a question, this is your, now your turn. You raise your hand. Councillor Soever, I've got you first, and, and Councillor Mackey, I see you'll be next. Councillor yes. Soever? Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, and I'd like to thank all the uh, members of the public who provided comments. Um, they're very uh, perceptive, uh, particularly uh, interested in, uh, as you, you will not remember, from my previous uh, discussion that this is council and growth projections. Uh, I am very concerned given the amount of growth we've seen here in the Blue Mountains that the growth projections are very conservative. And I was particularly interested in Mr. Singh's comments uh, on, uh, you know, the land that we have available, how much of that is actually developable. And also, um, you know, as we've seen in, in Collingwood nearby, uh, you know, they ran out of water capacity. Um, so, you know, do we have adequate uh, water and wastewater capacity 
And is it property located near the uh, the developable lands? And you know, if you address some of the issues raised by Mr. Singh, and I, I have had an opportunity to tour his developments in Bracebridge and Gravenhurst, and you know, they're very uh, well built, uh, modest homes, which you know we don't have a lot of here in the Blue Mountains and in Gray County. Um, so I'm glad that he has now shown an interest in coming here because, uh, you know, we certainly need homes in those price points. But, you know, and he, he is a well-informed uh, developer. So if he has concerns about, you know, how many net acres do we have in that some of the areas that we, we do have where we're planning future development aren't actually developable, I, I would, you know, certainly... Uh, want staff to follow up with him on that because um, you know it's we we know we know here in the Blue Mountains as well. I mean we we don't have a, a desperate situation yet, but we are very cognizant of our um, servicing capacity, particularly here in um, in the Thornbury area in the Thornbury wastewater treatment plant, which needs expansion before too long if development uh, continues at the current pace. So that is, uh, I guess, my comments for staff, my takeaway from the presentations. Thank you for that, Councillor Soever. I'll turn next to Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Warden. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks to all the participants for the, uh, the information that they shared. Uh, I, my question is for Scott. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, but the first one is, uh, uh, around tiny homes, Scott, and the definition of tiny homes. Uh, there's a wide variety of tiny homes out there. Some are permanent, some are, uh, are more mobile in fashion. Does the county have uh, some suggestion on what tiny homes uh, should be by definition? Mr. Warden, would you like staff to answer that now? Uh, if you would, please, yeah. Okay. In this case, I'm actually going to turn it over to, to uh, Becky Hillier of our department, who's our, our resident tiny home expert. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. And I, I'm not sure I would call myself that. There's certainly others on, the, on this call who are probably much more informed than I am. Uh, but thank you for your question. Um, I would say that we don't necessarily have a specific definition of what we would define as a tiny home. Um, there are certainly... Um, by the Ontario Building Code standards. I know that uh, there had been some hesitancy at some point to um, approve homes under a certain uh, floor area. Um, I think that the Ontario Building Code now does um, entertain smaller floor areas, uh, but it's sort of up to the municipal building, or sorry, the municipal zoning bylaws uh, to make that change as well. Um, I know that our municipalities have considered them uh, under different types of definitions, and there has been some uh, confusion and hesitancy on how to define them. Um, I don't think that it's really the county's um, sort of uh, business to be defining them, but we would certainly, um, you know, entertain different models, um, assuming that they are uh, safe, that they're uh, well serviced, uh, and that, you know, um, they're taken into consideration the other uh, features of a given site. Okay. Thank you, Becky. And uh, Randy, Thank you. Randy, if I might. Um, is it necessary to define a tiny home? My understanding is that the building code allows for, uh, I think it's 230 square foot, as, as little as that, right? And, and we're encouraging municipalities to get out of the way of the building code, right? Yeah, that's correct, Mr. Ward. And I think that's, that's what we've put in wording in the policies is to kind of let the building code kind of dictate in terms of um, what can be achieved when it comes to tiny homes. Um, so that way it's more defined in terms of what Becky was indicating in terms of making sure that they're of a size that's safe, that they can be, you know, serviced, um, whether it's on full services or if they are in the rural countryside on, on, on well and septic. Um, so that's, that's where we've kind of left it to the building code and through, like Becky said, through the municipal zoning bylaws and through the building officials to determine what can actually go on the site, but we encourage through the county policies 
um, to look at these as an option because we see them as an opportunity to address some of our affordable and attainable housing uh, challenges that we're experiencing throughout Gray County. Thank you for that clarification, Bianca. Uh, Councillor Mackey, anything else? No, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, those uh, clarifications. Uh, I guess it was more, I mean, I completely agree with uh, uh, the size being dictated by the building code. I guess it was more around the permanency versus, uh, you know, the, the mobility or mobile home type uh, smaller homes that uh, you sometimes see. These homes are built on, on frames and are portable. Uh, as opposed to the building code where you're actually attached to a foundation. So uh, that was some of the clarity I was, uh, was looking for. The, uh, the second, I guess, along the tiny homes is the, uh, Bianca mentioned uh, temporary uh, use bylaws to permit them. Um, any thoughts from our county staff around that? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for that question. And I should mention, um, I uh, Bianca has been really great at informing some of these policies as well. And I think she probably has a more sophisticated knowledge on some of the many coding elements of these things. Um, but yes, on, on the question of the, the temporary use bylaw. So under the Planning Act, uh, it's my understanding that um, they have, there's for a long time now, there's been something permitted that's called a garden suite, uh, which can per be permitted for a duration of 20 years. Uh, and so what we've recommended through uh, this policy is that garden suites, which are, you know, by their um, very nature, sort of temporary up to 20 years, uh, could be considered in our rural areas. Uh, and these would be homes that would be, you know, have some sort of permanence in, in, the, in the sense that they are, you know, uh, connected to uh, hopefully a septic system that's available on the site. Uh, but temporary in the sense that um, someone who perhaps doesn't own the land uh, could locate um, a, a tiny home there, live in it, own that unit, and perhaps at the end of that 20 years, you know, perhaps relocate it elsewhere, uh, but they still own that unit themselves. Uh, so, you know, it's an alternative to renting. It's an alternative to sort of a traditional uh, land and home ownership, essentially. Thank you. Very good. Are you finished, Councillor Mackey? Uh, no, but certainly, Mr. Warden, uh, you can, if you want, uh, you can go to someone else or I can ask my other question, whatever your preference is. No, uh, go ahead with your question. The, the question is around the uh, on-farm diversified and uh, whether there is a need for that to be secondary to the farm uh, occupation or the farm use. Seeing more and more uh, requests, and it's almost commercial type operations occurring out in the countryside where, you know, in, in some people's minds, they would be better set in an industrial commercial uh, uh, zoned area as opposed to on farm. And often these appear to be uh, primary and the, the farming seems to be secondary. So I'm just wondering Scott or uh, Randy's uh, response to that. Yeah, through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, thanks for your question, Councilor Mackey. So, a number of years ago, if we if we go back about 15 years ago, uh, the county in a previous previous official plan review, uh, staff were instructed to look for for more opportunities in the rural area. And at that point, and in our agricultural areas, at that point, uh, the provincial policy was relatively restrictive. Uh, and then in about 2014, uh, the province really opened up the doors on that, if you will, uh, and allowed for more types of businesses on farm um, that were meant to be secondary to the farm. And, and the secondary to the farm um, is a bit of a subjective term. Uh, the way the province outlines it is that it, it, it needs to be secondary to the farm in that uh, um, definitely in terms of land area. Um, so they recommend an, an absolute maximum of 2% of the farm would be occupied by the business. Um, but we've heard anecdotally through talking to some of these farmers and business owners that uh, from an income perspective, sometimes it's not always secondary and, and sometimes they might be generating every bit as much income from the, the, the side business, if you will, as they are from the farm. So what staff have attempted to do through our policies is allow for flexibility there that, that still allows the businesses and, and still allows definitely the primary use across the countryside to be uh, farming. Um, but we haven't put as much restrictions 
uh, on the types of businesses that can happen there um, as, as there would have been, say, 15 years ago, other than, you know, businesses that would require significant amounts of servicing that, that should definitely be on, on, uh, on um, municipal water, municipal sewer services. Um, but we have seen um, both successes from farmers and, and people that are celebrating that policy, um, but also people that have raised concerns and, and similar to maybe some of the points that you brought up, you know, at what point do you draw the line to say this, this on-farm business should, should maybe be in a, an industrial park versus on the farm? Um, so we're, we're not proposing any significant changes to that through official plan amendment number 11, but I would note we did get comments from uh, Ms. Christine Loft, uh, uh, who's representing uh, um, Mr. Martin and, and uh, his community, suggesting that we should further open those doors uh, and allow for them on smaller farms too. And the justification there has been that a lot of those smaller farms, uh, they're worried that uh, if there isn't flexibility for a business there, uh, they, they could fall just into a state ownership. Uh, and somebody might buy the farm and, and not be working the, the land at all uh, versus what Mr. Martin and Ms. Loft have put forward is allowing for a business on those smaller farms um, would further um, allow them to be bought and farmed. Um, but your point, if I'm understanding it correctly, is well taken with respect to um, sort of the definition of secondary, if you will. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I mean, it, it, it is really around the definition of secondary. We, we've seen a number and, and often it's from the uh, the Mennonite community, but you do get pushback from uh, you know residents that are living you know in that area. If there's going to be increased truck traffic or there's going to be increased uh, you know uh, well noise you know from generators and other things you know when they try to settle in a quiet country setting and now there's a commercial operation beside them. So there's uh, you know certainly two sides to it. So thank you for that uh, response. Thank you, Councillor Markey. Um, we're going to be, oh, um, Councillor Soever, did you have further questions or was that hand up from the previous? It's perhaps not even there. Um, we'll go to Deputy Warden McQueen. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden, and uh, thanks for all the presenters today. Uh, couple things uh, on tiny homes uh, at the Roma conference just recently they uh, did uh, talk about changes to the building code that included tiny homes so I haven't uh, I don't know much detail there but they just indicated that there were some recent changes that just uh, were implemented in the building code I know with our, ourselves in the municipality of Grey Highlands a few years back we removed the minimum size of homes to to allow the building code to sort of dictate what that size of a home could be but uh, I don't know if there's any comment there in it if not, but I just, they, 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 there was a comment made at the Roma conference about that. The other thought I had on, I just uh, I raised this a few years back with regards to tiny homes is the possibility of lots or rural lots or just building lots that if you were to put uh, a 4,000, know, on those lots, you could probably put like a 4,000 square foot home. But what happens if you put 4,000 square foot uh, tiny homes or, or, or four, 500 square foot tiny homes? Is there provisions for that? And I guess that would have maybe have to take an amendment. But I just think that uh, you know, for uh, opportunities for uh, uh, housing or or however, and, and you may have it on a two acre lot, and and that I don't know if there's any, any thought to that. But just going back to also with um, Councillor Mackey, um, the ability to uh, move a tiny home you know, probably more like a trailer, but then, you know, if in our municipalities, if somebody's got a trailer on a residential lot and somebody's living in it, well, no, you've got to move it out. And then, because that's not allowed. But the reason I raise that is say for the town of the mountains or areas of development or contractors, we know contractors are in short supply, but is there provisions for circumstances where a tiny home could provide a contractor a place to live? Maybe he's a young, or that person is a young person and it's the first step of getting ahead, but the tiny home could be a portable uh, on wheels tiny home. I know we had a home show a couple of years back when it was before COVID in, um, in Flesherton, our spring home show. And there was a, a, a firm that was building tiny homes on wheels uh, type of thing. So uh, I have other question, but I don't know if there's any comment to that. To you, Mr. Warden. Sure, I saw Becky uh, nodding her head. Becky, did you want to add something to that? 
Yeah, uh, so specifically just to the first question about the, the lot sizes piece, uh, that I, I do recognize that that is uh, certainly a consideration for our rural areas in particular, uh, which might be on fully private services, um, you know, with well water and uh, septic systems. Um, the the um, county has not set any limitations at this point about minimum lot sizes in our rural or agricultural areas, uh, but certainly um, the municipalities within the jurisdiction of their zoning bylaws could look to set those um, additional standards if they would want to consider a, mi a minimum lot size in those rural areas. Uh, they could also look at other elements like requiring a servicing study, um, one thing that the county has done is um, any, any um, uh, ARUs within uh, the countryside do have to be located within the existing farm cluster. Uh, so we wouldn't entertain, um, you know, multiple units sort of scattered throughout a farm field. They would all have to be clustered together. Um, so it wouldn't be the effect of looking like multiple lots are being created. All of the houses with it would be within relatively the same area or units, I should say. Deputy Warden? Yeah, well, thanks for that. And you know, and I was just thinking about the, I, the, I don't know if she has a comment with regards to the portable tiny home. I was just thinking in a sense that, uh, and I know of a story where a, guy, a young guy, he didn't have much, but he had a job and he had a trailer and he was living in a friend's place and that gave him a, a roof over his head, but then he was told to, to, through the bylaw enforcement they had to move it out. And, but he, he that individual, uh, was a hardworking uh, person, but he just, that was the only money he could afford to have a roof over his head. And you know what, I, I you know, sometimes, you know, you, you got, you know, like everything else, uh, you need a job to make money to get a roof over your head. And it's just, I just think of opportunities for young people or, or however, and we'll leave it at that, just maybe give that some thought. The other comment to Mr. Warden was um, uh, a number of discussions at the Roma conference as well, as you are probably aware or others that there was a paper uh, written uh, from Roma, that uh, was uh, drafted from Roma, the Roma uh, board with regards to uh, opportunities for increasing housing. As we know, it's been it's been indicated that in the province of Ontario, uh, there was one one mentioned that there's over seven hundred thousand units short uh, homes short in the province of Ontario. And obviously, as you know and others know, the price you know supply and demand has been has been driving that up and it's great to hear uh, uh lots of opportunities that, that are appraising itself here in, 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 in the county of gray i think you're, you're uh, it just uh, and we know the province and, and the premier and the, and the large town or city mayors had a meeting a few weeks back there seems to be uh, i think uh, from what i got out of the roma conference and just talking to a number of colleagues on amol and in the, the roma caucus there seems to be a change in, at foot to look at changes to possibly the provincial policy or other policies be put in place to create um, more opportunities for housing. And more particularly with Roma, with regards to rural Ontario, uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of changes have sort of changed development in rural Ontario, but there seems to be um, a conversation uh, about maybe making changes. So I guess my my question to you to, to Scott would be is, um, this is a long-term plan that we're looking at, but if there are uh, continual changes with regards to provincial policy or changes to uh, uh, planning uh, directives, uh, I guess we do another housekeeping bylaw. Is that how that works? Scott? Yeah, through you, Mr. Warden. Yeah, if there are changes to provincial policy or provincial legislation in that regard, um, the county could look at that through a future housekeeping bylaw or, or a future um, official plan review in that regard. We do have, we're legislated to, to need to review the, the plan every so many years anyway. I will say with respect to the housing changes, um, some of the changes in, in official plan amendment are trying to um, offer better justification uh, for why we could and should be developing at differing densities across our communities uh, and the benefits that are provided by density and, and maybe giving a bit of a sneak peek to uh, uh, next week's committee, the whole meeting, but there'll be a report coming forward uh, that we've now got a team of University of Guelph students working on the density question as well. Um, with respect to, to your comments, uh, Deputy Ward McQueen, about the, the rural housing, um, yeah, certainly staff are in, in um, um, 
in support of, of you know, keeping an eye on, on what happens at the provincial level in that regard. Uh, and if there are some changes there that, that dictate the need for, for uh, the county to reassess this issue, um, then, then we would love to bring something forward in the future. Well, well, thank you. And my last comment, Mr. Warden, is I think maybe Bob, let's maybe raise this, is just on a little bit of that theme and through your growth patterns, there seems to be, or, or a bit of discussion I've, I picked up as well as the ability to expand those develop or those um, uh, boundary, not boundary, well, the boundary areas of our built up areas, uh, whether they're uh, small, small urban or even rural uh, hamlets or, or, or areas of, of concentration and the ability to expand them. I know they did away, I think in 2005, provincial policy, as I recall, rural subdivisions were then eliminated, uh, that type of thing. But just in the sense of expanding um, uh, uh, urban boundaries and, and that, that urban could be dr drilled down to even smaller. But is there any discussion or thought? Because I think I, from the provincial why I think there's discussions around that too. And and just in the sense that all of a sudden there's a proposal or an amendment or changes with regards to expanding those boundaries to create more housing. Uh, Again, that's something I guess that does change in, in our plan as well. Is that correct? Yeah, through you, Mr. Warden. So, so the, the current provincial policy statement and the current county official plan have policies for, for how you consider those expansions. And because the county is, is outside of the growth plan area, we are under less restrictions than other parts of the province. Um, so there are certainly um, policies that guide that. And those are the policies that the town of Hanover has been working with to look at their expansion. Uh, there was a recent expansion approved in Southgate to Dundalk, um, which expanded that those uh, boundaries. And that was uh, when a developer came forward with an application for, for an expansion to the settlement area uh, to support a subdivision. And so it's my understanding that, that Mr. List and, and uh, Suresh have, have submitted their applications now uh, to both the county and, and uh, Municipality of Grey Highlands. Uh, to look at a small expansion to Markdale uh, and, and staff at the county and municipal level are certainly happy to work with uh, those two gentlemen and their teams uh, to discuss further and, and, and certainly uh, bring the matter back before county and municipal council in, in due time. Uh, thank you for that, Scott. My last comment to you, Mr. Warden, is there seems to be also discussion around the last two years whether, you know, up until uh, pre-COVID, everybody was migrating to the urban centers the last two years, it seems to be there's more migration out of the urban centers to rural or to smaller areas in the province, and it just seems to be just it just seems to be happening. And it just it was it was noted at the conference. That's just a comment that was made, and it just it's just interesting how time things can change. So it's just uh, it's just an observe, observation that I picked up. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden, and I, I do recall the minister at the. Um, the Roma conference uh, raising several times the Scotiabank uh, report, which talked about that number of housing that was uh, that was needed. Okay, we're turning next to uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Warden Hicks, and good afternoon, everyone. I too want to thank all the participants for their input and everyone who submitted comments. I just have a comment. I want to say I'm pleased to see that the county is continuing to direct growth to the two primary settlement areas and acknowledges that Hanover does not have sufficient lands to meet the growth projections. And the town of Hanover is fully supportive of OPA 11 and the identification of the future secondary plans adjacent to Hanover's boundaries. Thank you. Very good, thank you for that, succinct. <laughs> is there anyone else that uh, has questions or comments if not then i'm going to turn things over to uh staff for oh councilor mackey thanks mr warden and i certainly appreciate uh councilor patterson's comments around directing growth to our, our primary settlement areas uh, i don't think the uh, primary settlement areas need to be limited to owen sound and hanover but uh, I, I do think it should be to our primary settlement areas. Um, just a question, I think, for Randy or Scott around the, uh, the density policy review uh, for the primary settlement areas. Will that take into consideration 
uh, some of our smaller hamlets that maybe don't have full servicing. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden. In this case, some of the policies in, in um, official, plan, official plan amendment number 11 uh, speak specifically to our primary settlement areas, and those are all the settlement areas in the county uh, that are fully serviced by municipal water and municipal sewer services. That said, there are other policies uh, that speak to how we efficiently develop um, within our other settlement areas. So those would be our, our, um, our secondary settlement areas, ones that might have uh, uh, partial services in terms of municipal water and, and, uh, and private septic systems, such as, as uh, Chatsworth and, and Walters Falls in that regard. So there's some further guidance there, um, speaking to sort of the, the efficiency of land and, and making sure that you know, short-term development doesn't uh, unduly prejudice uh, the long-term development potential of those lands. Um, but it's not, um, there's not radically different policies uh, for those settlement areas through, um, through official plan amendment number 11. Um, the report that we're having the University of Guelph students uh, work on, which uh, you'll get a preview of at, at the next uh, County Committee of the Whole session, uh, what we're doing there is instructing the students uh, to look at density in all its forms. So what does density look like if you have municipal water and sewer? What does density look like if you're on wells and septics? Because we realize that all of our communities across Gray County are growing. Um, some have the benefit of, of, um, of municipal services, so maybe they're growing at a different rate, um, but certainly we're seeing lots of interest in, in some of those other areas as well. So we want to make sure that we're not leaving any kind of policy void there, if you will. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councilor Mackey. And your point is well taken. Um, Hanover and Owen Sound seems to be referred to every time we talk about primary settlement areas, but they're the only two that are wholly designated primary settlement areas. I wonder, staff, if you might just tell us, because um, I don't have that number handy, how many primary settlement areas are there uh, in the County of Red? I can take a stab at that, or Randy, if you want to jump in here. but. Yeah, I can't remember the exact number, but definitely it's it's got to be around eight, nine, ten, somewhere in there. Like we've got, of course, um, uh, Meaford, uh, which is in the municipality of Meaford, obviously, a former town of Meaford. We've got Thornbury, Clarksburg. Uh, we've got uh, Markdale, Dundalk, Durham, Newstadt. I'm probably leaving some off here. But yeah, so eight or nine, somewhere in there. I think the point is uh, well taken that um, we need to acknowledge that there are a number of primary settlement areas. I think that was Councillor Mackey's uh, point, right? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Soever, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. And I was just going to follow up on that. And now I'm reminded that there's probably a good thing we can do in the official plan in terms of definition of uh, settlement areas in that the um, the Blue Mountains, which of course has had 40% uh, of the building permits roughly over the last three or four years, is an area of huge growth. And, um, you know, and, and Director Scherzer just mentioned Thornbury and Clarksburg, but we have a huge area that's, and I always forget because the towns and the county's name is different for it. It's the uh, residential Rec recreational or Recreational resort area. Yeah, recre. Oh, okay, I got the towns one then. Okay, so maybe we could standardize that name. But the other thing is that's a de facto um, settlement area, and that creates a lot of confusion among some of our residents in that it's not defined as a um, settlement area. But then, if you read the wording in the plan, it does define it as a kind of a settlement area. And it's kind of like being half pregnant, I guess. I don't know. But it's very confusing to people because they say, well, why are you allowing that development? Because uh, it's not in the settlement area because I looked at the map and, you know, it's not. And then you go, well, actually, it's a little more complicated than that. You have to go read the fine print in the town official plan and the county official plan. And then you'll see that, in fact, they are defined as settlement areas. And actually... Most of our development in the Craig Leith area is following falling within that designation. And I would say that, you know, if you believe the, the numbers in our budget and the county budget, that 
we will be responsible for 88% of uh, supplementaries next year. So I, I don't think that's necessarily accurate, but that's the way the numbers shake out in the documents. But um, certainly we, we have a lot of growth here. And I think if we could straighten out that definition of recreational area, I mean, um, settlement area for that, because it's just now says if it's zoned that way, um, you know, it's de defined as uh, re within the settlement area, but it's not on the settlement area map. Uh, Scott? If I could, Mr. Warden, thank you for those comments, uh, Councillor Soever, and, and that's a good point. And we've actually heard from, from a few members from, from uh, your municipality on that comment. And, and, and you're right, I think, you know, as you said, I think it's it's buried in the fine print of the county plan that is defined as a settlement area. Uh, but when you look at the map and you see the term settlement area applied to specific um, uh, areas of growth and, and not those recreational resort areas, I can see where it could be confusing. So maybe as staff, we need to look at a, a different nomenclature there to A, try to make sure we're being consistent with um, terms that you use in your own town plan and B, to make it very clear to, to the public that those uh, recreational uh, resort areas are a key focus of growth, uh, not only in Blue Mountains, but in some other municipalities as well, and, and definitely defined as a southern area. So uh, thank you for raising that. Very good. Okay. I do not see any other uh, hands. So with that said, it's probably time that I turn things over to staff now, if you want to make uh, your final comments and talk about next steps as well. Great. Thank you, Mr. Warden. So I'm just going to share my screen one final time here to go through some next steps. Um, so uh, hopefully you can see that there now. We are at the public meeting stage today, which is February 23rd. Uh, staff, we're hoping that uh, whether it's municipalities or members of the public or developers or, or anyone else could submit their initial comments in, in writing to staff uh, by end of day on Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022. At that point, staff will, will sit down and, and start to uh, review those comments. And in some cases, there might be some further research or further work needed by staff to, to dig into some of those comments. Uh, in some cases, we might need to reach back out to the people that made those comments to try to make sure we're understanding it better. Um, and then as staff, will look at uh, whether any further changes are needed to official plan amendment number 11. And, and certainly, I can't speak on behalf of all staff, but just based on the notes uh, I, I've made here already today, I, I'm thinking that there's definitely going to be some changes that need to be made. Uh, so what staff would hope to do at that point is, is propose those changes uh, and, and uh, prepare um, a response uh, uh, to the comments received. And that response will most likely be in the form of a staff report that comes back to committee the whole uh, for, for uh, committee, committee and council's consideration. But it'll also be, be um, shared with those people that have chosen to make comments with us. So they can see how their comments were, were, were addressed and, and uh, how they've been, been, been reflected in the plan, uh, if it's something that we do have a, a possibility to change there. There is the potential through that process, if we're looking at major changes to the plan, uh, that there might be the need for another public meeting. At this point, we can't tell just based on we don't know what, uh, what the proposed changes will be. Um, so there might be another public meeting, or if not, uh, the matter would come back before committee of the whole for their deliberation. And ultimately, uh, if they saw for, fit to, to support the amendment, um, there could be a, a bylaw prepared for council. Uh, at that point, if there was an approval, we would issue notice and, and all those that requested notice would get it. Um, there is the chance at that point that there could be appeals to the plan, um, but we're hopeful that we can uh, work with members of the community and work with our, our, our nine member municipalities uh, such that we don't see any appeals. So at this stage, there's no um, dates uh, to be aware of other than this February 22nd date, by which point we're hoping to receive the comments uh, and then we'll keep uh, both council and the public informed as to our next steps and, and when the matter might be coming back forward for, for council's review in that regard. So certainly that's all I have at this stage unless there's any further questions. Well, I think that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Um, I wanna thank everyone for attending today, all of those people who made delegations. Thank you very much. And thank you as well to the staff. Uh, this is not easy stuff to push along. <laughs> so I know you've done a lot of uh, hard work behind the scenes and we'll con continue to do uh, hard work uh, addressing uh, difficult uh, difficult issues. Um, so I don't think we need a formal uh, motion to adjourn. I think we can simply say we are now concluded, correct? Am I correct about that? Yes, yeah. that is correct. Very good. Okay, so thanks again, everyone. Have a good day.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.